Imagine living a life where home is not one place but spans across multiple cultures and countries. Feeling like you belong everywhere and nowhere all at once. Growing up speaking different languages and having to incorporate elements of different cultures into your everyday life. This is the reality for the so-called third culture kids or TCKs, children who have spent a significant part of their developmental years outside their parents' culture. I've always been drawn to people with these multicultural experiences because they often have to navigate a unique and sometimes difficult path of adaptation and identity formation. Most of my friends, I would say, happen to be third culture kids and after spending years getting to know them, I've learned quite a bit about identity, adaptability, and the concept of feeling rootless. So in this video, we are diving into the world of third culture kids and gaining some insight into their experiences, challenges, and the stories that define their journeys. I think the multiculturalism is such a foundational part of my understanding of the world. I think I'm very open-minded because of the experience that I've had being able to talk to different people. I often felt sort of judged because on the outside, I'm a brown woman. When I speak, I don't sound Indian, I sound American. Yet I didn't grow up in America. That confused a lot of people. Your, your English is very good. I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> I am a native English speaker. My, my mother is also an English professor. And he was like, oh, okay, that explains it. What explains it? I had conflicts with my parents mostly. Conflicts with um, members of my family who might not understand what, what being grown in different countries means, what being exposed to the Western world means, what that kind of mindset really means. A lot of stress and pain where you're just like, oh, you don't get me, you don't understand me. In a way, I fit into every context, yet I fit nowhere. Building relationships from that perspective has been a little bit more difficult for me. A lot of kids who have this third culture aspect to their identity, they have that through forced migration and displacement and a lot of times being sent away when they didn't necessarily want to be sent away. What I look like and where I feel I'm from are very different things, very different things. After the Second World War, international mobility increased significantly. Diplomatic missions, military deployments, and international organizations like the United Nations required families to relocate across the world. Higher education became more international, allowing many families to move abroad to pursue educational prospects for their children. And advances in transportation and communication made it easier for families to live and work in different countries. These new developments led sociologist Ruth Hill Usim to study the impact of living abroad on expatriate families and their children. During a visit to India to study American families working there, she noticed that the children of expatriates were developing a unique cultural identity, one that was distinct from both their parents' home culture and their host culture. Usim referred to this hybrid identity as a third culture and coined the term third culture kids. Back then, TCKs were primarily the children of diplomats, military personnel, and corporate employees. But nowadays, that category has shifted to include children of missionaries, international school teachers, digital nomads, and people escaping war and other forms of conflict. Professionals are taking more assignments abroad. There are more international schools, which means that kids are transitioning between different educational systems. And there are a lot more student exchange programs or gap years that encourage young people to spend more time in other countries, all of which contributes to the TCK phenomenon. There are a few common traits that characterize TCKs, and although these are generalizations, studies have also confirmed that they exist. But the first trait that comes to mind is adaptability. Having lived in multiple countries, TCKs develop an ability to adjust to different environments and cultures quickly. They learn to navigate different societal norms, languages, and lifestyle, all of which makes them flexible in various situations. And this adaptability often carries over into adulthood enabling them to thrive in diverse workplaces and multicultural settings. The second is linguistic skills. Exposure to different languages from such a young age often results in TCKs becoming multilingual. 
they might speak different languages fluently and may have this natural aptitude for picking up new languages. And this not only improves their communication skills, but deepens their understanding of different cultures. Third is a heightened cultural awareness and sensitivity. Growing up in different contexts teaches them to appreciate and respect diverse perspectives and practices. Living in various cultural contexts makes them open-minded, which also allows them to build relationships with people from various backgrounds and also to approach life with a broader perspective. Their worldview tends to transcend national boundaries and they may actually see themselves more as part of a global community rather than being tied to a single nation. But growing up between worlds isn't always as cool as it may sound. Constantly moving and adapting to cultures may lead to a complex sense of self. A common challenge for a lot of TCKs is forming a cohesive identity, and they may find it difficult to pinpoint one cultural identity as what they claim is truly theirs. Moving around a lot can also mean that they're unable to form long-term friendships or establish a deep connection to a particular place or community. TCKs may also feel like outsiders, both in their parents' native culture and in their host culture. So it kind of feels like they're on the fringes of the cultures they find themselves in. And this leads to an ongoing process of self-discovery and redefinition as they integrate different cultural elements into their sense of self. While some TCKs easily embrace the concept of being global citizens, others may struggle with the questions of who am I and where do I belong? But here's the thing, third culture kid is just a label given to people with these multicultural experiences. We have to remember that each individual's experience is different and can't fully be captured by this term. And you don't even need to be a third culture kid by definition to relate to these things. But if there's one major takeaway that I've gotten from all of this is that we are way more than we appear on the outside, more than the labels society assigns to us. We are the product of migrations and movements, conquests and conflict, and resilience and resistance. The answer to the question, where are you from, is a story. A story of self-discovery, a celebration of diversity, and above all, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. Firstly, I want you to... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is intake at a psychiatric facility. <laughs> um, can you tell me a bit about where you're from? Sure. I am ethnically Armenian, um, but my family was, or my parents rather, were born and raised in Baku, in Soviet Azerbaijan. And in the late 80s, they left during a time of war. And they spent about eight years traveling uh, between different countries trying to find a safe place for us, uh, my sister and I, to be raised. Um, so I was born in Russia, but I was mainly raised in Brooklyn, in New York City. I'm originally Indian. I was born in New Delhi. I lived there for about eight years before we moved to South Africa. I went to an American international school in South Africa, so not really a local school. Um, I finished high school there and then went on to university in Boston, Massachusetts. Didn't quite fit in, so moved to um, Switzerland after. In the middle of that I also did a internship, a six-month internship in Singapore and sort of kept coming back to the country um, throughout my bachelor's and then for my master's I moved to London and I've been here in the UK ever since. I was kind of born, I was not kind of born, I was born <laughs> in uh, uh, India. I was born in Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu and uh, I moved out of Tamil Nadu after I turned four and I grew up in Singapore for about a year and a half before I went to Brunei uh, where I lived for four years. We had a sh brief period where we went, moved to Malaysia as well then stayed in Singapore for the rest of, rest of that uh, high school and junior college period. I did my national service in Singapore uh, before I went to university. So I went to undergrad in uh, University of Nottingham and that's kind of where I transitioned into the UK. Maybe I'd say I'm more Singaporean um, but there are moments where Indian comes out and there are moments where the Western British mindset comes as well. So I don't know, it's like it's almost here and there. I was born in Muscat, Oman. I finished my high school in till I was 18 years old and I moved to India 
for to study medicine my undergrad and I also worked for a year in India so that was another eight years in India and I am now in London but I am of Indian descent so it's a it's a mixed bag of you know identities I feel like I will never have the claim you know to being from any particular place because I think at the core of what we are and the core of who we are as you know humans I think our identity is very married to the land and I have never really felt like there is a land that I you know could call my own. So I'm a UN kid right so my parents are with the United Nations which means that growing up I had an expat life and not just you know a regular expat a diplomatic expat with certain privileges um, I might even say luxuries um, but with that came the fact that even though I was able to afford going to really good international schools I wasn't able to ignore the fact that our, our school was built right next to a township and the inequalities of life were very very um, evident to me as a kid I feel like what has really helped me again is having that wide perspective of you know different people can be different there are different languages different ways in which languages form cultures cultures form um, traditions and you know you mix that with other factors such as religion or what whatever else you name it right but at the same time I can definitely say that perhaps there is a large amount of privilege there that not a lot of people are able to recognize within the international community um, or the third culture kid community because their experiences have just been so different and unique to anyone else in the world. When I was living in India, I predominantly spoke Hindi even though I understood Punjabi and also going to an English medium school. So it's very interesting, even though I was learning everything in English at school, I was still more confident um, speaking Hindi and conversing in Hindi. Um, but as I moved to South Africa, that had to completely change. I started thinking from Hindi to English. Um, oftentimes at the beginning, I would have to translate in my head. I would think in Hindi, then translate it into English before I spoke. But over time, I realized I started just thinking in English, which changed a lot because obviously, I think language forms such a big part of culture. And the kind of language I was exposed to was, you know, a more American accent or more, um, you know, an international culture. It, it was a combination of several different things that started to change my perspective about the world as well. So I, I really went from a more traditional Indian perspective on life to a very Western perspective, which I think still stands with me today. Often also causes a little bit of conflict with sort of like my family or people I know from back home, whereas I don't still feel completely comfortable with what you would say a completely Western person might might be. I think mixing Russian, English in particular growing up was again trying to barter between different identities because when we would travel back to Armenia uh, and to Russia and to visit relatives all over the place because growing up a lot of my relatives were literally all over the world after this war everyone had settled in different ways in different countries and Poland and Italy and Armenia and Russia all around the United States it was a way to actually be able to talk to these relatives um, especially if they didn't know English. So I think that kind of code switching, aspect of code switching was very uh, important and became very important to me early on. I think my parents did a really good job, despite having seen some horrendous 
stuff um, and having survived quite a lot, they did a really good job of giving us a very joyful childhood to the point where I didn't realize that we were refugees <laughs> well until I was in college probably where I finally translated some of the words for myself of like, oh, I guess that, that is a unique thing, that is unusual. I think because of that experience of quite literally being persecuted for a particular identity and a cultural identity that you have in a majority culture um, and then moving from place to place to place trying to find somewhere to fit in I think that has subconsciously kind of seeped into the way that I um, that I see myself and that also the way that I um, interact with uh, other people, you know, other people who might see the similar, a same fate or have experience of that type of persecution. That makes me very sensitive uh, to it. Now, the conflict has always been, you know, the traditional versus the more liberal. And I think this has always been a negotiation, and I'm sure uh, this is not unusual for a lot of people who carry a lot of different cultures. But inevitably, one culture might have different mores and particular uh, social expectations, especially in terms of gender. So what women are supposed to do, what they're not supposed to do. Um, I didn't feel that so much with my parents, but certainly, um, you know, for instance, visiting family in Armenia, visiting family in Russia, even visiting some family in the United States, the understanding of the expectation of what a girl should be doing, what she shouldn't be doing, um, is, is and was quite pronounced, especially when you consider my baseline culture, which is working class Brooklyn, New York City, where from 13 years old onward, I've just been hanging out and kind of seeing all types of people all the time, doing all types of things, you know. I always thought I was very exposed um, to a lot of things until I went to the next place. And living in Singapore, I felt, you know, I think very different from people from India. And I thought I was a lot more open-minded and forward-thinking. Uh, and having lived in Brunei, I thought, you know, I had this extra additional culture that people won't understand. There's Malay culture uh, and it, it felt, it felt like I knew too, uh, I knew a lot more than I um, than I actually did and I came to the UK and I just went okay fine I don't I what I knew is not what I know that's why I tell people if I, they ask me where are you who you where are you from I'll tell people I'm Singaporean but then I'll say I, I was born in India because like I felt I feel the need to fill those two together because that is my identity it's not it's not going to be oh I'm Singaporean or I am Indian it's a mix and that's kind of where I identify belonging wise, I think I'm, I'm Singaporean, I feel Singapore is home. But when I think of um, family, I think of India, I think of grandparents, etc. So it's a bit of a mix. Having been raised with your parents affects a lot of how you approach friendships as well. Because when I shared the kind of friends I have at home, I felt like a part of me wanted my parents to also understand that world. And I made Indian friends mostly because I went to an Indian school. That's the world I was in. I came to university here. I hung out with mostly British people in the first first year because that's who that's who those are the people who were there when I was engaging at the start, and they were open and welcoming. But then with time, I started engaging with so many diverse people because, like, I would say my the friends I'm still in touch with from university undergrad are all very diverse. They're from different places. And that sort of only happened after they came out of their um, their culture shock almost. And we all met and it just happened. And it played a big part of the kind of friends I wanted to make since then. It's like, it helped me see that, okay, um, moving from Singapore to the UK showed me I didn't have too much knowledge. But when I meet people from different places, I'm able to tap into a little bit of knowledge of what their world is like, that life is like. So it got a bit addictive to find friends from different cultures. Um, and I think that's how I see friendship now as well. 
if I think about it now and I ask myself, you know, where do I belong? I can never tell you that my home is in one place. Because if you're any any non Omani living in Oman, you're always just extremely conscious of the fact that you are not from here. Um, especially with my parents who technically I'm sponsored. I'm, my visa was always a sponsored visa by my parents. Um, there's, there's always a deadline to that status. It's always been, you know, I am from Oman until a certain time. If while I was living in India, I definitely did not feel like I was from there. I looked the part, but I never, never felt the part. I grew up in a very Indian household, but it was not as, you know, it wasn't traditional, I will say. Living in an Islamic country, yes, there were, you know, very, very different perspectives, but I think inside the house, inside the home, um, it was a very, we, we celebrated festivals, we did our, you know, every time we weren't a very religious house, um, we would only, you know, do prayers during festival times. And I, I do realize that that's not the case. If you, it wouldn't have been the case if I lived in India. Oman is a very, you know, a very liberal country. It's got so many temples, so many churches, and it, it definitely helped me helped us to maintain our culture in uh, outside of India. When we moved to South Africa, that was the first time I was in a culture um, surrounded by people that didn't necessarily think like me, talk like me, have the same um, you know, mindsets or cultural traditions at home that I did. So it did cause a lot of conflicts between my parents and I. Um, something as simple as going for a sleepover was something that my parents were absolutely not comfortable with. Um, however, it was such a norm for my friends. That's also where I saw some of my friendships maybe take a back seat. But then with time, people around me also adjusted because obviously I was in an international school. So, I mean, we had a lot of fights going through those phases. But it pushed me to make my parents communicate with me more. Traditionally, I also feel perhaps sometimes Indian parents aren't as open with their kids. But our circumstances sort of made us have to open up to each other. Because even for my mom or for my dad, they were also in completely new environments. We really didn't have anyone that understood what we were going through as a family except for each other. So. I think communication really, really helped us get through those conflicts. If you find the right balance between, you know, what your communication style can be and how people can meet you as well when they're communicating, a lot of that conflict does dissipate. As, as most people would know, when you move on from one place to another, the one who stays will always feel like you've moved on. And naturally, um, there's a separation. But when you obviously have gone to a new place and you're growing, your mind is growing in a, in a different way. Whereas the people who've stayed are just having the same perspective of you. Um, it makes it more difficult. So I, I do think it it's more difficult for me to keep in touch unless the people who've remained are also doing the work to grow. Um, so I have maintained friendships with people who've done that. Um, but it is reducing as, in time, as time is progressing. Um, and the knowledges I had from the foreign cultures or cultures that, that are foreign for, for my family who are more, uh, who believe they're more native and they don't have, they don't have a third culture feeling. Um, I had conflicts with my parents mostly, conflicts with um, members of my family who might not understand what, what being grown in different countries means, what being exposed to the Western world means what, um, what, what that kind of mindset really means. 
and that caused a lot of conflict. Um, it causes conflict day to day and my wife being also a third culture kid experiences similar things with my family and how I managed it when I was on my own is very different from how I'm meant to manage it now because I think when I was on my own I had to just embrace this knowledge and understand things from my perspective and what are what what um, what my values are and how those affects those uh, situations but now uh, with with being married as well there is extra layer of and she having to understand her values and managing them from her perspective and me understanding that as well so there is a lot of cultural difference between third culture people as well and that's what I'm learning now and I didn't think um, it was that different before then. Growing up um, I remember the expectation being that I couldn't speak English as well as other kids who could and were raised I suppose in the States who were born in the States uh, where I wasn't and I think very early on, a lot of my childhood memories in school, which I loved, I loved being in school, there was an emphasis for myself on excelling, especially in English and literature, which I had an, a natural inclination towards anyway. I think for me, it was a very confrontational response to an assumption of, you're not from here, um, and so surely you can't speak as well, or you have an accent, or this or that, and so there was a a kind of need to prove not just proficiency and fluency, but almost like a mastery of uh, the language. And I think I found that in general uh, with the way that I approach learning languages is trying to sound as native as possible. Now I'm coming to understand that I do have an implicit hybridity in my language as I do in my identity. And so that will come out, right? Um, I think there are many examples from the Armenian context of the expe expectation of growing up in a place where women are, quote, more free, and so therefore I don't cook, I don't clean, I don't do all of this stuff. It's not the case. I was raised in a very different way. Um, but I think that has been an interesting thing that I'm looking at like currently for myself, of how much of my femininity has been challenged coming from the U.S. back to a culture that should be native to, to me and realizing that there are assumptions around how I'm not fully socialized as a girl because I'm not traditional in some way. Um, so it's been a point of pain, but it's also kind of been a point of um, a confrontation in a good way. like confronting some of those expectations and trying to parse through them. When I moved to India, I realized that I didn't have much trouble meeting and making friends. But here, um, I remember the first day of university. It was lunchtime and it, I swear it was like a scene out of a movie, a scene out of a chick flick where someone's standing with their lunch tray and they don't know where to go, they're new and, you know, they're deciding what table will welcome me. And it, it was, for the first time, it was a choice that I was faced with. There was one table with two Indian girls. I have grown up with a lot of, you know, multicultural individuals. I have been exposed to lots of non-Indian people living in Oman. But my first instinct was to go to that table. And I did, I did go to that table. And I was, I came home and I was talking to my sister. She asked me, did you make any friends? And I said, yes, I, I made two Indian friends. She was like, why did you feel the need to go to that table? Why didn't you go sit at any other table? And I didn't have an answer for her. And I think maybe on that first day, I was trying to, I don't know, make a, a choice where I would feel more comfortable. But since then, I have been forcing myself to feel uncomfortable, make myself uncomfortable. I have to be more open. I have to be, you know, I have to put myself in an uncomfortable position. And it's not always easy. It's really important for you to get in touch 
with who you are and by that I mean really explore what is it that's pushing you in opposite directions. If you feel disconnected from your family, spend more time with your family. Try to break the barriers in communication and same goes the other direction. If you feel like you're not able to connect with your friends or you know people at work even uh, if you grew up as a third culture kid you might still struggle with identity issues talk to those people more figure out what else there is that life can offer you because it will definitely help you shape your identity a little bit more and you'll you'll know when you know you connect to certain things just be true to yourself in in, in that sense just let your heart take you where you're meant to go and i think that would be the best way to just find yourself the fact that we're calling it a third culture kid is already narrowing narrowing down the identity it's it's building a community i'd say it's building a community of people who might not fit feel like they fit in one place and that makes it unique and i know that still doesn't narrow down identity or like you're this person you're that person but what's What's great about that is the knowledge that you bring is always going to be different from the other person in your community and that is the identity uh, and I'd say instead of instead of feeling like you don't fit in one place it's the it's the thought that you might fit in multiple places um might help you feel like you you belong everywhere it's important to to keep the times in mind when you're struggling with identity i know that that is that is also a big part of it you know you're living outside your country and you you want to feel like you know you are a substantial you have a substantial identity but that doesn't always mean you know holding on to traditions that don't make sense for you for the times you know it's it it's important to i think consider a lot of perspectives and take your time doing that you know it's not something that you have to decide today and also your identity what your identity is today would be very different from what it is tomorrow so i think it's not to be rigid you know and always have an open mind i think that's the most important I spent a lot of time and even now still I have an inclination to find someone just like me. Just like me from the same place, from the same diaspora, grown up in the same way. And I realized that that is not impossible but extremely difficult and ultimately uh, doesn't lead to the sense of peace that you think it will. So the advice that I have is to seek people out who understand maybe not in the exact way that you understand yourself and you understand the world but understand enough where you can talk about these negotiations of self and about some of the more painful experiences that come from being third culture because on the whole when you think about this experience of having multiple cultures in your arsenal you almost might think, oh, that's that's a really good thing, right? That's, that's you're more culturally fluent. You speak multiple languages. You're bilingual or trilingual. You've seen so much of the world. And sometimes you take a step back and you think, well, that's also come at times from a lot of trauma because a lot of kids who have this third culture aspect to their identity, they have that through forced migration and displacement and a lot of times being sent away when they didn't necessarily want to be sent away. Um, so I think that my advice would be to find people who understand you enough as a baseline, regardless of their own personal culture, that you can start pulling out these aspects of yourself and showing uh, them to the world, or being more vulnerable to be able to understand yourself and be at peace with yourself. Great. That's all. We're going to do that a second time. No, we are not. Oh my God. It was I'm great. great. It was amazing. I was not breathing, but thank you. It was great.